Conference and Corporate Ago. Uh, we'll start with apologies, and I have one from Bronwyn. Um, everyone else is here, I think. So could I have a mover, please? Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Roger. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Carried. Um, any disclosure of members' interests? Yes, I'll just pop one in there for Andrew, who's, um, yeah, I think on the Federated Farmers submission. Okay, Liz. Um, look, I, I don't think you need to step out of the room or anything like that um, in, this, in this case, but thanks for that. Um, late items. Now, we do have a submission from the Tilmudu Chamber that was for whatever reason late, but it's has been accepted. So could I have a mover that that is accepted? Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Marcus. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Contrary, no. So that's carried. So that we'll come to that. Um, yeah, well, that's. I think everyone's had a chance to read that. So um, we'll take that in. And Jo tells me she's updated the statistics for um, that submission. So that's all good. So confirmation of the order of the meeting, um, very few items. So yeah, don't think there'll be any change, Ken, all good? Um, yeah, no, just uh, just a single item, Andrew. Great, so uh, could have a mover. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Claire, all in favor? All right. Contrary, no, it's carried. Okay, um, so we go to confirmation of the minutes, um, which are on pages seven, eight, nine, and 10. And if there's no changes or comments on those, could I have a mover to accept as a true and correct record? Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Mike. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, no. It's carried. Okay, we'll move on to tab six, which is the representation review. And um, start with our first submitter, who is Sue, or who I see there. Welcome, Sue. All good? You're good to go? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. Floor is yours. And uh, Sue's uh, um, submission's on page 140 of our agenda. Andrew, did you just want to talk about the bell? Oh, yes, sorry, <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, so um, as you know, so you're very familiar with the um, way these go, but there's a bell, two, two bells, it'll be one at eight minutes and um, one at ten. So you have ten minutes to speak and you are being live streamed. Just a warning. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, this is just to back up the submission that we actually made. Um, just to talk about community boards. Um, a community board is an elected body that works at a grassroots level in the specific geographic area that they represent, which is termed a community of interest. And the local government commission said that a community of interest is the area to which one feels a sense of belonging and to which one looks social service and economic support. Geographic features and the roading network can affect the sense of belonging to an area. The community of interest can often be by about access to the goods and services needed for everyday existence. So people like to know that there is someone or a body that they can come to for all sorts of reasons. And community boards, we work at a grassroots level in our specific geographic area. Um, we have, in our meetings, we start with a public forum. So we actually get quite a few meetings where we will have one or two and sometimes even more people coming to ask a question or make a suggestion. And this is good, um, you know, particularly when we get suggestions about things that people would like to see in our community. Um, this also happens at um, the Lions Market once a month where... Deputy Mayor Liz and I try to attend and we get quite a lot of people will come and they will ask about or make suggestions that of things that the community boards could be doing. Um, so, And we also at the start of, as I say, the forum, we have 
of the community board meeting, we have a forum. So anyone's welcome to attend and they usually work quite well. The other thing that we as community boards do that's quite important, and we've just done this recently, is to make decisions about applications that have been made for the community discretionary grants. And because we're locals, we have an understanding and knowledge of the groups actually making these applications. And I'm sure this does make a difference to how um, grants are made. I think if it was left to a wider body or a body that perhaps didn't have the knowledge of what goes on in our community, um, it wouldn't be quite so successful. And, and the other thing that happens, and all of our board members are known in the community. They're approached on a regular basis by the public asking questions or making suggestions about our area, um, which is, you know, one of the one of the really good things. And quite often, our board members will come back to the board and say, "Hey, where well, somebody has suggested this, so this is really good." We also have board members who are representatives to the committees or boards of various community organisations, such as the Cambridge Museum, the Cambridge Community Social Services Committee, the Cambridge Tree Trust, the Arts Council and others. And these are really important for linking um, those groups with the community board and ultimately with what goes on at a higher level at the council. Um, and I think this has been really appreciated by a lot of these groups. The board also takes the initiative in, um, in just some activities around the town. And in this current term, we've established um, some new community vegetable gardens in some of our reserves with local residents acting as guardians. And these have been very, very successful. So far, we have three of them and we hope to have some more. And they're really helpful and people really enjoy being able to go and pick some fresh vegetables, no questions asked, it's great. Um, we also do things like, we've continued with our Christmas tree light project. Uh, we run the ANZAC and Armistice services in conjunction with the RSA. And these are really big events in our town and I think it's appreciated by all the community that we actually do this. Um, we also run a very popular little library, which was in an old telephone box that had been donated to the town by the old New Zealand post office when they decided they no longer needed a phone in it. But we've adapted it and we've looked after it. And that's a very popular thing that we do. Um, so, and there's hardly a day goes by where at least one of our board members is not approached by a member of our community for some reason, be it a query or a suggestion. So as a, as a board, we're the people on the ground for the local authority. Um, so we, we enjoy doing this. We think it's important. And one of the other things we do that's really important and one of the reasons that um, I think that quite a lot of people in our community appreciate it because we often get suggestions is we run community board awards which go to deserving members of our community already this year we have done three of them these are always top secret events from the recipient um, somebody will suggest it and usually people that are well known and respected in the community and we have gone about and we have surprised them with an award and it's usually a great event for them and their friends. Right. It's always happened at our board meeting and the award is made and the lucky recipient and their friends and family will go off and they'll have a bit of a celebration somewhere. And these are really great events. We really enjoy it. And I'm not sure that the council, if it didn't have boards, would be doing these. So we, and we, we have a list of people still that we want to award things too. So I think that's just one of the reasons, those are just some of the reasons we think that community boards are important. I'm open to questions. Yeah, thanks Sue. If anyone, yeah, has got uh, Roger. Yes, Roger. Oh, I can't You're on mute, Roger. Yeah. 
How about that? Is that better? Yes. Morning, morning, Sue. How are you? Good, thank you. Good, thank you for that. I wonder if you would like to speak for a, a little minute on the advocacy role of the community board on matters uh, related to the Cambridge community in regards to uh, the overall council uh, direction. Yes, I think I think we have we we do that too. We 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 submit, as I say, to the um, council frequently, and there are things that we have done recently. We we particularly the library is one um, thing that we are very strong on. We're not giving up on our advocacy for um, a new library building, for example. Um, we will ask questions about reserves and things as well. But at the moment, I think the library is our big focus. We've already said we're not giving up. Good, thank you. And the other is the the idea of rural tours, which uh, oh, yes. I think, yes, uh, is a, an important aspect of the community board. It is. Thank you for reminding me, Roger. Yes, we do the rural tours each year. Um, and it, it, goes, it happens over two Saturdays in the winter. Um, we pile into the, the cars and we go and visit communities and the, we meet them at the different rural halls we have around the, around the community. Um, always worthwhile. We get a lot of people attending them. This year in particular, we've had really good attendances at the halls. Um, and, and this has been good, especially when it comes to making the community board grants, because we have an idea of what's happening out in those rural parts of our community. And when they come with a request, we're actually able to make it. And that really is something that we can do. And there's just that link. They're not forgotten out there. They're part of our, our board area. Okay, Thank you. thanks for that. I think uh, Liz and then Mike. Yeah, hey, look, thank you, Sue, for the work in that uh, all the community board members do in our, um, in our district. You do a fine job, you really do. Hey, um, my question is just around, um, I guess, the yeah, the visibility of community board members. And uh, and I guess we always have, and particularly in Cambridge and our bigger towns, we have a lot of new people moving into our district all the time. Do you think that council could be doing a better job of improving the visibility of the community boards? Because I just see in some of the submissions, you know, there are some that still don't um, see the value or don't see necessarily or know who community board members are. And I, and I absolutely um, expect there'll be some who don't, uh, you know, even try to find this information out, but perhaps we could do a better job of, of your visibility as well. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. I think there's probably a good idea. Um, when you buy a house in Cambridge or you're building a house, you get, you know, a little package that often has information about different things pertaining to the council. And maybe it could be mentioned that there are community boards and mention the members or we have been doing ourselves periodically um, a column in one of the local newspapers. Um, but I think people really, you know, you're quite right, Liz. People just don't know that there is a, um, a community board. And I think there's probably a problem nationwide. Um, when I went to the community board conference, that, that was an issue that was coming up that... Not everybody knows that there is a community board. I mean, I mean it's, it's the same goes that a lot of people don't know who their councillors are either, if there's a council. So I'm not quite sure. I think this is probably a local government issue nationwide, and, um, but we will have to do better. I know that we have periodically put an item in the community newspapers, but um, it's a matter of getting it in there and remembering to do it. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Mike? Yes, Mike. Yeah, good morning, Sue. Um, yeah, and again, look, hey, thank you for the valuable work that the Cambridge Community Board or both community boards do for our communities. Hey, just a question, and it relates to your submission, um, but also I picked it up from another submission from an individual, and it's, uh, do you support the proposed names for WIPA and uh, the community boards put neutral? And I just want to talk in particular about the Mangatotali ward name. Um, and it comes off when the other submissions are read. Yeah. And I, I picked up what you said about community boards should represent the community of interest. 
and, and access to the service or the service town that, that they're, mm. they're sort of the hub. So my question to you is, currently we have the Mangatauturi Ward, which encompasses, you know, along with a bunch of other places, but Te Mangakawa, Mangakawa, Fencourt, Whitehall, Karapiro, um, Monavale, for instance, um, and also further up into the foothills. So by calling it Mangatauturi, are we sort of disenfranchising a large part of the, of the rural ward? And a suggestion was made that it could be called the Cambridge Rural Ward. Just suggest, just just a, any feedback on that. That's that's probably a good idea. I think we perhaps need to consult Iwi as well on that because after all, we are using um, the name of the Amonga for the ward, um, and perhaps it's a bit of a wider conversation we need to have. So rural ward may be the thing, but then um, you'll get some people who will say what is the rural ward and thinking it's just a bunch of farmers perhaps when we all know that there are little communities up there who are not necessarily farmers mm. um, yeah it's it's a tricky one that Mike but it's it's a good point that you right. um, bring up thank yeah you. So, thank you okay, thanks for that I think we're all good now thanks Sue for that um, yeah uh, we'll catch up with you no yeah. doubt. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye. Bye. Okay, is Angela available? Hi, Andrew. Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Great. So, uh, just to, I don't know if you heard uh, with Sue, but the, there'll be a bell at eight minutes and another at 10 when you are completed. So, um, and you are being live streamed. So, welcome and um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Morena Koto, Your Worship, the Mayor, Councillors, staff and members of the community watching. The majority of the Te Omutu Community Board would like to highlight these main points in regard to the representation review. One, we support the reduction of councillors to maintain a level that is consistent with our Waipa population. The boundary changes to enable a fair spread of council have a say in what their ward is named. We, two, we support the continuation of community boards because it is a democratically elected board that advocates for the respective subdivisions, in our case, Te Awamutu, Kihikihi, and the rural subdivision requested a breakdown of. Community board is going to be even more valuable with the reduction of councillors, as they are going to have even less time to interact with the community powers to the community board. We do a lot of unrecognised work that the public and councillors do not see due to count. A uh, community board having a very limited public profile, credit is not given appropriately, and until recently re rarely reported to council outside of our annual reports. If one councillor can do what is required for community board, and some of our board prefer we went further and had no councillor representation. See, we already have appropriately elected subdivision members to ensure fair representation of both they should not be able to vote on matters that they get to make the final decision on at the council table. Principal Policy Advisor at Local Government New Zealand, Mike Reid, says in relation to community boards, their effectiveness depends on whether the council gives them any decision-making role. And so it really comes down to local context. Seriously, and given the opportunity to have more responsibility and feedback directly to council. A seat at the council table with speaking rights could be a step in the right direction. So to sum up, are community boards relevant in 2021? Absolutely. They are for exactly the same reasons they were established. Te Awamutu, Kihikihi and Kekipuku need their own voice. Councillors are supposed to be advocating for Waipa, not their individual ward. We need to provide a mechanism to improve, I'm sorry, empower community engagement, definitely. Regardless of all the fancy ways to communicate, people still want and relate best to having a person to speak to, someone who listens and does their very best to help them achieve the impacts of COVID is our lack of connection with others, and connection is community board's key attribute. Does evidence show we are making a difference? Through community board efforts, we have urban miners now operating in Te Awamutu, have removed a good deal of wattles from Kakapuku, conducted a rural tour. We address many issues that come to us via reports, getting footpaths mended, raise issues that otherwise fall on deaf ears, 
such as the George Street car park and Pollard Street lighting that we are still working on. Our achievements may not be huge, but they are many and mostly unseen. Our council has not set anything for us to achieve other than to allocate the discretionary fund, which we conduct in a fully transparent manner with the added benefit that we know of many of the organizations and what they do through our own networks. What we do is not easily measured by outcomes, benchmarks and KPIs, because our job is about connecting with people and community. Our community boards meeting the ever more complex two-way communication needs of communities. Yes, via our public forum, direct networking with various community groups, the rural tour, we are increasing engagement on social media, particularly Facebook. We have key connections in our communities and we work at the grassroots. We do not need to be doing the council comms job by providing a full complement of communication channels. That kind of duplication would be a waste of the ratepayers' money. More importantly, our community boards meeting residents and ratepayer expectations. Most of the people who use community board services believe so and indicate accordingly. As an example, I am frequently being thanked by people for the articles in the papers. The fact that they do not complete your reviews and surveys does not mean they do not value and appreciate what we do as a community board. Value for money? Yes, community board currently costs approximately $200,000 per year, of which members get approximately a quarter. However, despite the current total cost, that is the equivalent of $10 a year per ratepayer in our subdivisions. Right now, with the many changes that are coming from government, with the reforms, the impact of COVID, and the changes in our council, we need some stability. There are some possible alternatives to community boards. Let's explore these, test them, get feedback, rather than act in haste and throw the baby out with the bathwater. At this point in time, for the foreseeable future, community boards are a trusted and reliable mechanism that listen and support the needs of our respective communities. Kia ora rawa atu. Thank you. Thanks, um, Ange. Uh, you've obviously put a lot of thought into that submission, and uh, there's a lot of points to consider there. Roger, you have a question. Hi, Roger. Yes, hello, Ange. Yeah, and uh, congratulations on the amount of work that you do in the community board. One of the matters that you that you identified there was the communication between the community board and council. Um, before my time, so I've been told, the agenda of the community boards used to be on the, oh, sorry, the minutes of the community board used to be on the agenda of council. And there was a particular time allocation during council meetings for any aspects of that minutes to be raised. Is it time that we went back to that again, do you think? Um, mm. I think that's definitely a possibility. It was something that... Um, Oh, just if my memory serves me correctly, we we did request that we could have a, an allocation because otherwise we had just included in other meetings councillors have attended, I believe. Um, and we were told that with our two councillors um, representing us that we had adequate opportunity, there was adequate opportunity at the council table for community board voices to be heard. Um, so that was where it sat. Hmm. Thanks for that. Um, do we have any other questions? Oh. Hazel. D D Hi, Hazel. Th th thank you, Andrew. Um, congratulations, Ange. That was a very good presentation of, uh, of the work that you do. I, and I see the, the offshoots of all of the, the energy that you put into the community and the community. I think, I think our Te Aumutu and Kakapuka people are pretty lucky that they actually know who you are and, and so, therefore, keep up the good work. Thank you. Appreciate your support, Hazel. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, um, Mike. Mike, yeah. Yeah, hi, Ange. Um, hi. Yeah, hi, your passion is um, <clears throat> a passionate piece of rhetoric, which um, had a lot of sort of salient points, really. Um, it would be actually nice to, to actually get a copy of what you've just read out, because 
the submission sort of states some things, but you put a lot more than just the submission in, into what you've said. And look, I really do think it's time, and I'm really talking to a council staff here as well, that that we actually look at this seriously. I mean, there's a lot of good points brought up there, and a lot of them, this is not the first time they've been brought up. Um, and I think on both sides of the, you know, both sides of the swamp, so to speak, the community boards are, are open to change and open to change for the better. And mm -hmm. I think it's really time that we sat down with the right people in the room, uh, including Gary, um, to see what these folks can do. If they're offering to do more, what can we get them to do? Um, how can we maybe resource them? And as Liz pointed out, how can we help them actually lift their, their profile while, while doing that? So I really would like a copy of that to go to all the councillors. And I think we should be mm. bringing that back to, to a meeting. So I'll lay that in your court there, Ken. Well, of course, that's what this deliberation is about. So, uh, you know, to consider these things and make decisions. But Ken, you wanted to make a comment? So, Andrew. Yes, yeah, so, so, sorry, Andrew. I was just acknowledging um, acknowledging Mike's request that um, that we circulate um, that, that that additional stuff from Ange. So, so the government's team will do that. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Oh, sorry, um, Claire, and then Liz. Thanks, Andrew. And um, well done, and you've done a great submission there for us to consider. Um, in fact, you know, you raise a lot of questions. Like you said that. Um, how much work's been done behind the scenes that, that that council doesn't know about from community boards. And I was just wondering, like, you know, how many hours a week do you spend on community board stuff? And what would happen, you know, what wouldn't get done if you weren't in that role? Um, well, I generally spend a minimum of 10 hours a week um, trying to keep up with all my community board things. Um, but um, there are weeks where I actually would do in excess of that. So, for example, um, I'm not fast at doing this and I like to try and research my material and things. So, um, you know, that can take me a good deal longer. So, for example, I spent most of yesterday, uh, sorry, Sunday, trying to, um, you know, put all this together. I'd already started on it, but, yeah, in addition to, yeah, so... Um, a good in a good excess of 10 to 15 hours a week on average probably mm. and and you mentioned that it's really connecting with people in the community while you're out and about as well that you said that it's having someone that people know and recognize and and bump into as they're sort of out and about doing this stuff that you get those sort of interactions and that you feel that that's where the connection arises um absolutely you know look, there's nothing at the end of the day, there's nothing better than that, you know, face to face. Um, that's why it's so important um, to in in Kopapa Māori, um, Kanohi te Kanohi. Um, it, it, it's it's the thing that makes us work. You know, we are, we are community people. We we live together. We thrive together. Um, and so that's where I think we really have have that grassroots connection. Um, that is really valuable. And, and when you're talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, you tend to get a very honest perspective and you also get the opportunity that if they're unsure about something that you can actually take the time to explain it. Whereas when it's just being communicated at them, they interpret it how they choose to interpret it. Um, and then that's what they resp their response is based on. Um, so, you know, I think without that, ability to do that, we, we really run into um, some dangerous territory, as we've seen on a worldwide level, through um, all of the, you know, the miscommunication that's out there now through social media, um, you know, in regard to things like COVID, you know, it's, it's getting ri ridiculous that um, this, uh, the COVID vaccine is currently uh, a mechanism to brainwash us. We're just being tested to see if it's going to work. You know, it's getting ridiculous, but people believe this rubbish. Whereas yeah, at least um, if they're seeing us one-on-one. -on -one, I'll just interrupt you there for a moment. Order. We yeah. could go on forever on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. I didn't mean to do that <laughs> to you, Andrew. Yeah, so uh, um, sorry, um, Mr. move on to Liz. Liz. Yeah, hey, look, Ange, that was, a, that was a really impressive submission and thank you for the thought that you put into it. Hey, um, 
I'm interested in your thoughts around how you um, how the community board should be reporting back to council. Do you feel that the status, well, obviously you don't feel the status quo is quite working, um, but do you feel it should be the chair of the community board um, with a direct report and direct seat at the table at some portion of a meeting? Or is it uh, should it still be left to those who are um, councillors who are sitting on and at the community board meetings? Um, it, there would be times when it would be really great if the if the chairperson or a representative from the community board, it doesn't always have to be the chair because I think we also have to remember that um, most of us all have full-time jobs um, as well. So uh, sometimes it makes it a bit tricky for us to, to be everywhere. Um, so... Um, we have made some changes at the moment to hopefully improve our um, opportunity for our councillors to come back and report um, on a more regular basis. Um, so I'd like to see how that works first, but definitely I think there are times when it would be opportune for a, a member of the community board to actually um, be a, a, able to come, yes, okay, to council. Thanks. Um... Thanks, Ange. Uh, look, um, Lou, did you want to make a comment? Um, I see Phil with his hand up. We are running out of time on this one. So yeah, thanks, Andrew. Please make it quick. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Just, just a quick thing here. As a community board representative, there are periods of time when we as councillors would have a conflict of interest because we have to make decisions for the district-wide, mm -hmm. whereas a person directly from the community board could actually represent their viewpoints in a, a regional or a local area. So I just wanted to raise that point. So we are often conflicted a little bit that we have to sit down and make a general decision and in doing so would actually remove ourselves. Just a thought. Yeah, thanks, Lou. Um, mm. Phil. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, just as a quick suggestion, at, at our full council meetings, we do we do a um, an update of meetings that we've attended. <clears throat> so even if... Um, if the councillors there could report back, there would be an opportunity there to report back from the community board. And just going on from what Lou said about conflict of interest, there's two councillors, so you could divvy up, you know, who says what type of thing if there is a conflict of interest. But that that's a a, a suggestion that could be could remit, well could quickly fix that anyway, or, or temporarily anyway, or to start with. Yeah. Okay, look, thanks for that. Um, look, just a quick reminder to everyone that um, we're here to hear submissions and ask questions directly about them, not really to, um, you, you know, the, the deliberations is the place to make suggestions about um, what we could do and and how that would Im impact on the, on the decision we make uh, rather than at this point. So, yeah, just, okay, cool. All right, thanks, Ange. That's great. And uh, thanks for your submission. And we'll move on. Thank you. As, as, and I see Janet is here for um, representing the Prongy Award Committee, page 174. Hi, Janet. The floor is yours. Oh, yes. Good morning, um, everybody, the mayor, the councillors, and anyone else that is there. Um, community groups. Now, the, the um, Prongy Award Committee. Now, this committee was actually formed by the previous mayor, Alan Livingston. Now, Alan felt there was a need for this committee to be formed. And we have representatives from all the little rural communities that there are on this committee. Now, we've heard a lot this morning from the previous two um, sorry, the previous two um, community board um, chair people. And I'm sure they do a fantastic job. I'm not aware, I've learnt more about what they do do this morning than what I knew before. But there is a cost to this. And, you know, we've heard the figure of $54,356. Now, I can tell you the Prongy Award Committee costs nothing. Yes, we do have a council employee there taking the minutes, and we have two councillors there. And it's only just come in that we um, can now claim for mileage. 
to attend the meeting. Apart from that, um, there is no costs at all. But we, we do not do the rural tours. That is a point of difference. We do do the discretionary funds. We know our rural communities because we're representing those rural communities. Rural people know what happens in rural areas. And looking after the Parongi Award area is important to that committee with the decisions that we make. We hear a lot about what goes on with council. I, I don't think it would be too much different to how the community boards operate. And if there is to be a review of the community boards, surely it has to be looked at as to those community boards actually becoming committees like the Prongy Award Committee. We all volunteer our time. And as I say, we represent the people. Council often shoulder tap people or we are asked for people in areas when we have someone who retires from the committee, they need to be replaced. So people are actually identified by um, people who know these people rather than an election for a community board member. So we believe that the um, community boards as they are, they do a good job. But as the, if there is to be a review, we need to actually review also the Prongy Award Committee because we're at the mercy of the mayor, the incoming mayor and councillors as to whether this Prongy Award Committee will continue at their next election. So far, we've been lucky, but there's nothing to say that if there is a change of councillors and mayor, that they may decide no. If there is some review and the, it is to be rolled out that community boards are for Te Amutu and Cambridge remain, should we be looking at a community board for Baronia? That way, our views and our representation is actually guaranteed, whereas there's no guarantee with a committee. With the Prongy Award Committee, the proposal is that we only have one councillor rather than the two very efficient councillors that we have at present. This, we feel, is unfair. The area that the rural areas actually are longer. There's a huge distance for people to, to cover. Rural people actually pay a lot of money in rates. You've got to go and find a lot of houses in town to get the same rateable value that you do from rural people. I know that the um, the, the numbers that each councillor actually has to work with of, of um, people living in an area needs to be averaged out to all the councillors. And if Kaipaki was to remain in the Prongy Award as it is at present, your figures would be distorted. At the moment, the proposal is that the Prongi Award actually has the highest numbers of residents per councillor than any other councillor in the proposal. You can have a plus um, or minus of 10% to the figure that you actually have said. Looking at it, there's a, we only need 172 more people to actually go over the plus or minus being the plus on top. And if we had Kaipaki still in as it is presently, there's more than 172 people living in Kaipaki. Kaipaki contributes a lot to the Prongy Award Committee. And 
we need kaipaki in there. Kaipaki has been, in the proposal, removed in order for the figures to balance. And if we had more people, and if we had a truer, um, my understanding is these figures, population figures, actually go back to the 2018 census. Now, that census was the census that was almost, well, I'm not going to say, it's the census that was the least, least um, correct census of all. And many of you will remember the controversy that was held over the figures that were actually came out of that census. Has the council actually looked at the population growth in the schools? I believe there's more than 172 people living in the Prongia ward area taking away kaipaking than what there was in 2018. We in the committee believe that we need two councillors. We have both councillors attend our meetings, which we meet in chambers at um, the council building. This next coming year, the plan is that we will meet in different locations. So like the community boards, we can actually see what people are talking about when they bring it to the table. Different rural areas do have different issues. And it's good to actually go and see that area that they're talking about. And that is a plan that we've actually got. And obviously, the people who live in those areas where those issues are will be invited to attend that meeting as well. When people think of a meeting in a council building, they think of it as a closed meeting. I know the meetings are open to the public, but the public um, don't generally attend. So, uh, Janet, uh, just we are running a bit short on time, and I think there might be a couple of people who'd like to ask a question. Certainly. Is it, uh, Philip? I saw you had your hand up a minute ago. No, you're okay. Um, Claire. Um, yeah, thanks, Andrew. And uh, thanks, Janet. Janet, it's great to see you here and um, speaking on behalf of the Kidongi Award Committee. And you've raised some interesting points. Um, I, I wanted to check with you about, um, you're obviously concerned about the continuation of the Pirongi Award, you know, after the next election. But one of the things in the representation review is, um, you know, like you could say that the Pirongi Award could come under the Tiamuru Community Board or something instead. So what would your um, reaction be to, to that kind of proposal? So you wouldn't have the Pirongi Community Board, I'm sorry, Pirongi Ward Committee anymore, but you'd actually be um, part of the Tiamuru Community Board. Why, why wouldn't that be um, sort of your preferred option? It's not a preferred option. Tiamuru is Tiamuru. Tiamuru is urban, it is not rural. It is, a real, it is an urban centre um, in a rural um, district because it's a district council. Te Amuru, there are many houses in a street in Te Amuru, And that's another point. Um, Te Amuru has streets. Rural has roads. We are different. You have to go a long way down the road to find another house. But we in um, Ahapo and Nahanapuri have huge growth plans and, and council has approved this. So the growth is actually going to be there in those areas. For Prongi Award Committee, the, the, effect, the work that we do and the effectiveness that we have for the cost value to the council is huge. We which person would be the person that you would choose from the committee to go on to the Te Aumuru board? What would happen to the discretionary money? We, we rely on these representatives on the committee to actually talk about the applications that we actually have for the discretionary money. Rural people know rural people. They know their communities they are in. 
Okay, thank, thanks, Janet. Thank I, I think we've got that point. Um, but Liz has got a quick question, and then we'll move on to Janet again. Um, thank you. For your next submission, Liz. Yeah, thank you, Janet. Hey, look, and look, a big thank you to all the volunteers on that current committee, because, you know, it, it is really important we have that view. I guess my question is around how... Um, how, how this committee is perceived, and I agree with you, it's untidy at the moment, and it's and you, I kind of feel like you're a little bit in limbo, because I'm not too sure uh, for those on the committee, if you're not elected by your community, how you can have a mandate to represent your community, and that's the bit that I'm struggling with at the moment, um, is that there's no election process for those on the current committee. And I'm interested in your thoughts around how we might be able to improve on that, um, you know, given our kind of current situation? My understanding is that the council actually approves the representative. So although the community has not actually voted for um, the representatives that are on the committee now, someone has actually put the name forward to the council for council to approve. So I'm sure there's been some background work done by the council to actually accept this person or that person to be on the committee no okay yep no that's great thanks for that um, we're uh, over time so i'll ask you to move on to your your next submission janet thanks thank you sorry community. Uh, sorry. which is sorry. on page, page sorry. 130 thank sorry you. mike no that's what i was asking for thank you cool The community hall, the Coromatua Memorial Hall Association Incorporated, I am the chairperson of that hall. And we had our AGM recently where we did have the privilege of having all three councillors, Claire St. Pierre, Bruce Thomas, and, um, and our Waikato representative councillor, Noel Smith. Now, Coromatua is actually the very top end of Waipa for those that don't know. And we actually have a hall levy on all the ratepayers and they contribute to the council and the council reimburses that money. Now, the Fodder Fodder um, Community Hall is actually going to be built. And that means that we actually lose our Waikato councillor, Noel Smith, because the Waikato residents that are on the other side of the, the border or Coromatua Road um, are no longer going to contribute. So we will only, we lose a third of our income. So not only are we losing a third of our income, you're asking us with this proposal to lose, a th to only have one third of representation of councillors. Noel Smith goes because those people, go, he goes with those people. You're asking us to, to only have one councillor for Parongia. We have had issues at that hall and we have relied on both Bruce and Claire to assist us with those and point us in the right direction into helping with those issues that we've had. And it may just be a recommendation to actually talk to this person or I'll get that person to come back to you with it. If you're asking that there only be one councillor, that one councillor in a rural area has a huge distance to cover. And how are they actually going to do it? I understand from other councils, including around New Zealand, which I can't talk of the South Island, but I can talk of the North Island, where these um, reviews have taken place, and yes, they have accepted um, Māori wards, which is a fantastic thing to happen. But there hasn't been a loss in total of councillors. With Waipa, you're asking that there's, there, well, not asking, there is going to be a Māori ward. But that's one extra one extra councillor, but you're actually taking um, two councillors away. One from Cambridge that was actually went in in the last recently, so that that's coming out, and then 
one from Prongia to go. We have huge growth in the Prongia ward area. And as I said previously, 172 people is all it takes for that line to, to be distorted. So does that mean that you'd actually creep the um, boundary line from Kaipaki further in, coming in um, to take more people in there? Uh, That's so, yeah, look, I, I think we've pretty much covered the ground there. Um, and just to put the record straight, uh, we're, we're losing three councillors and gaining one. So we're actually losing a councillor from Te Aumutu, from yes, Cambridge, yes. and from what is now going to be, the, or if the proposal is passed, now going to be the combined Kakapuku and Pirongia ward. So it's not exactly right that Prongia is losing a councillor because Kakapuku Prongia combined is losing a councillor. Uh, it, it might be a bit of a fine point, but I just thought I'd, I'd make it. Um, and I think we've got the gist of your submission. But does anyone have questions to ask Janet? Uh, Graham. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Janet, good morning. Thank you for that. Good morning. Um, having had a lot to do with the halls in Mangatau Tree, can I ask, are uh, now the people in the Waikato district across the Koromatua Road not dedicating the hall as their local hall? Um, we have this issue, we've had this issue before, and if they designate it as their local hall, then we get that council to rate and then they pay the money to that hall. Is, can you just explain that to me, please? Waipa goes as far up as Koromatua Road. Yeah, yeah. And on the other side of Koromatua Road, and actually this was the boundary that was used for COVID. I, yep. Koromatua was level two. And okay. on the other side of Koromatua Road, although a part of Koromatua Road was level three. So we are on the boundary. And Waikato District Council asked us or highly recommended to us that the residents that actually live um, in their area will actually, they pay their rates to the Waikato District Council and they would very much like to support their, their new hall complex that's being built at Whara Whara. So they have had many meetings in Whara Whara regarding giving money to Waipa District Council when they actually pay Waikato District Council and they yep. want to support their own. And, and recently they've had their rugby club um, fire as well. So yeah. their community is really tight and yep. they want to look after each other. Like yep. we all want to look after our communities that we live in. Yep. 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 Thank you. I just wanted to see the, the reason you've given it to yeah. me. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Graham. Claire, you have a question. Quick question. We're on time. Just. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, um, Janet, again, for making the point about the loss of councillors. I think I'd just like to clarify, it's not that, um, yeah, uh, like Andrew, you were saying that there'd still be two councillors within the Pirongia Kakapuku ward, but given the huge distance, you know, like that ward will now extend from just below Hamilton City, like where Koromatura is, right across to Lake Arapuni. Yeah. yeah, so I think, Janet, what you're suggesting is that there'd probably be a rationalisation of which councillors would attend meetings like at Koromatua to just sort of spread, yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that really, but I think it's it's just a, a logistics or, a, you know, a pragmatic approach to the, the large distances that would be needed to for councillors to, yeah, go and meet at various, um, yeah, communities and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Claire, and thank you, Janet, for your submission. Um, it, will, it will be taken into account when we do our deliberations. Okay, you, so we're moving on to Jackie and Andrew from Waikato Federated Farmers. Welcome, and um, as for the others, uh, there will be a bell, although I've heard no bell so far, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, at eight minutes, uh, uh, you're at ten, and you are being live streamed, so the floor is yours. Kia ora koutou. Thank you very much for having us here to submit, to be heard. Uh, Fitz, 
just a quick introduction. I've got Andrew Raymer here. He's our Dairy Chair and our Tiamutu Chair. And I'm the Waikato President. We have 10 different chairs around. So later on, I'll pass over to Andrew because he's the local expert. Uh, FEDS is a primary sector voluntary membership organisation and we represent the needs and interests of those undertaking farming activities. Our members range from lifestyle block holders to corporate style farms and we had the duty of care of rural communities in the event of an adverse event. I will now pass over to Andrew to talk to our submission and I hope that uh, he has a good time with that. <laughs> I'm sure. <I> will. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, good morning, everybody. Hey, um, so I'm just sitting up the cow shed, and uh, the timing is just perfect. The AB technicians just walked in, so I've got that going on in the background. So um, that's all good. Uh, uh, yes, as Jackie said, I'm um, the Tiamudu uh, branch chairman, so um, sitting here with that hat on this morning. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to thank uh, Joe Greed. Joe came in and spoke to Timuru Federated Farmers a couple of weeks ago, and uh, that was just much appreciated. It really clarified a few things for our members, and um, it was well presented. So, it, um, so just uh, I don't know if she's listening in, but just thanks for that, Joe. Um, so, our submission is uh, pretty straightforward, really, to be honest. It basically supports the proposal that Council put up. Uh, that Joe put up anyway, just on um, reducing uh, total council numbers. We had some concern, I think, as Janet sort of pointed out initially, that um, you know, it seemed to be reducing the rural wards and whatever, but once we sort of saw what she put up, that it seemed to be proportional and it wasn't unfairly um, affecting the rural wards. So um, uh, we uh, support less councils in total, and uh, which theoretically should reduce some costs, but uh, it all seems to be a proportion to rural and urban, so we were in support of that. Um, so that, that was good. Um, yeah. Also, just like to sort of uh, listening in this morning, support what Sue and Ange have said just on the community boards and the, and the strength of the community boards and the work that they do. And that probably lines up with the main part of our submission that we would we see that the Perongia rural wards should mirror the councillors in that area. So two councillors in that area, two um, community board members um, elected so that, that we have that strong connection to community boards for, as they've pointed out, you know, the strength and the value of that institution of what, what community boards do. So, um, um, yeah, we, we feel that that would be a, it's just a simple list um, confusion about what's the award committee and what's all that. People understand how they work, works well at the moment for the Kakapuka Award and the Manga Territory Award. So um, just roll that out across the whole the whole um, of council and just mirror the councillors. Um, so that's that's the guts of our um, submission there. Um, yeah, it's about it actually. So unless there's any questions. Cool. Oh, thanks, Andrew and Jackie. Yeah, do I have any questions? Uh, uh, Susan. Uh, through you, um, um, through the chair. Um, hi, Andrew. Hi, Jackie. Thank you for your submission and the time taken um, to um, complete that and forward it to us. I've got a couple of questions. Um, on to the second page of your submission, you've said um, your, it was developed using feedback received from your members. Just quite like to know how, how you went about procuring that feedback from your members um, and how many responded. And then secondly, you've gone on to say that it was your, your uh, submission was written by our policy advisor. And I want to know and um, try and understand the extent of the policy advisor's inquiries and research into the specific um, situation that we have in Waipa, because I'm obviously aware that Fed Farmers um, submits on all REP reviews right throughout the country as, so far as it relates to rural areas. So I want, I'd quite like to understand that. So perhaps if you could just answer those questions, it'd be helpful. Thank you. I'll start with the policy. Yeah, the policy does use uh, scenarios from across the country when when discussing what they think should be submitted, and then we feed back on that. So the, that will go to our Tiamudu branch, and we held the meeting to try and get people there to understand what's happening and get feedback to feedback to the policy person to then write the submission. So that is how that process works. So how many people attended the meeting then? I'm just trying to understand your, the, 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 the 
spread of the, or the extent of the net you've cast in terms of that rural farming community and their understanding of, of what the proposal is. Andrew, you had the yeah, numbers? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I just, just muted the noise, background noise out there. Um, uh, so yeah, as I sort of mentioned there, we did hold a meeting with the members and um, uh, oh, I can not count the numbers exactly, but it, it, to be honest, it wasn't well represented. We weren't that many members. We had <laughs> we had bigger meetings with uh, lesser topics, really. So it was a bit unfortunate. Um, I did receive some sort of feedback, just some email feedback and a text from another member that they couldn't make it, but that they um, just to say that they support, you know, reduction councillors. So it was sort of taking in what was at the meeting as well as some outside sort of um, communication from there. So. Uh, just, just to, like I say, to support the reduction of members. Okay, so I guess my specific um, area of interest is um, the submission made in terms of retention of the community board. Um, I'm just curious to find out what your members' understanding is in terms of what the community boards have done for them, uh, for farmers over the last, say, three years. Do they have any understanding about that? And if, if so, what are the specifics? Uh, specifically on that, it was probably not so much what the community boards have done, but there was a confusion about what the ward committee was and how. So it was almost the other side that people, and I'm probably talking about two members in particular, were saying, why why doesn't Bromia have a, a community board or the connection to the community board? Why is it different? And so, so yeah, it was almost an endorsement of the Kakapuka ward who does have a community board representative and it's an elected position, which was the key they sort of felt that those positions should be elected and and to mirror what Kakapoka now has, currently has. Okay. Hope that answers yeah. that, Susan, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, so it still doesn't really clarify the um, your members' understanding about the effectiveness and meaningfulness of the community boards for them, I guess, as a rural community, and that's, and it's a position that your submission has taken. That's all. That's, that, thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks, Jackie. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Graham, quickly. Yeah. Um, thanks, um, Andrew. Yeah. Good morning, um, Andrew. Andrew <laughs> and Jackie. Um, I, I think your submission about having a um, a person from the Parangi Award on the community board has actually got some merit and it's worth considering. You know, Janet made the comment about who would you select. Well you wouldn't select, you would be a voted member, I would have thought, to get onto that board like everybody else. But I think um, I think we should have a good talk about that. That might be advantageous to have that person there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Graham. Okay, thanks, Andrew and Jackie, for your submission and um, answering the questions. Now, I understand that Ruth Webb is next, but not available right at the moment. So that's still correct. Clear? Um, yes, yeah, she's not on, so we're just okay. making sure that Kane is happy to speak next. Um, Karen's just um, messaging him at the moment. Uh, yep, Kane's all ready to go if you want to okay. take him on now. So, so Kane's good to go. Uh, just for um, <coughs> councillors, that's on is, uh, page 137 is the um, of our agenda is Kane's submission, and um, Kane. Uh, you you will hear a bell at eight minutes and again at ten. So um, hopefully, it'll be a chance for people to ask questions. So, Kane, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Andrew. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm for retaining the community boards with a view uh, with a few suggested adjustments, which I will come to. In my opinion, it is very important that the Community Board is truly independent and has the ability to challenge council on issues. Indeed, I recall reading an article a few years ago from former chair and current board member, Gary Derbyshire, where he stated that it was part of the community board's role to hold council accountable. This is the reason community boards are independent, having a committee structure, while sounds good in theory, has the key issue of not being independent and lacking teeth to take action. I, like many people, believe democracy is founded on checks and balances within the system. Without that check on power, we would end up without any ability for recourse. For example, currently it is still possible for the council to cease fluoridation. Fluoridation, for those that are unaware, is the addition of a hazardous waste product to the shared public water supply. 
Since the 90s, over 11 councils have used their democracy and taken the opportunity to end fluoridation. 11 councils took the opportunity to end fluoridation in the face of ridicule from the Ministry of Health. They stopped it despite the pressure they have received from the supposed experts. Currently, Kane, 29 of 67 Kane, I'm, just going to, I'm just going to interrupt you there. This is about the representation review, not, not fluoridation. We all take your point. Yep. But please yep. keep it to, to the topic. Thanks. Now I'm speaking about democracy. You see, so this check on de decision making is about is taken away from communities and potentially being given to one person. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because I have firsthand experience of anti democratic processes within this council. For five years, I've attempted to push through this issue, and now there are 70 studies showing a lowering of IQ from fluoride. When I spoke to you in August 2019, I shared with you a major study. Since that time, an additional seven studies have been published. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is that as a member of the community board, I would expect to at least be shown some respect on this position. On the contrary, when Waipa District Council prepared the Health Select Committee submission, community board members were completely ignored. I read your submission, and without going through it in detail due to the time, the key point that you missed is, was that the Waipa District Council wanted the Ministry of Health to provide a report every two years to placate people like myself who are questioning science. The key thing that I've been trying point, to... Point of order, about, point of order. I believe Chairperson Brown has actually asked you to remain on point in terms of this representation review. Yep. My, my sense is that the, the area of discussion you're moving into is, is not relevant to that review. Uh, I have I just, to agree. I disagree. And, I disagree. Well, well I, I agree. And I'm asking you, please, to keep this to the representation review. This is not about fluoridation. I appreciate yes, that. I'm, Andrew, I'm using it as an example. I'm using it as an example of anti-democratic processes well, within you the council. Stick, stick to those processes, please. If you go back to fluoridation, you will be removed from the meeting. Okay. The key thing that I've been trying to get through is the need for independent review and independence. For example, I know the top lawyers and scientists on this issue and could support an independent review. Uh, now, reading your application from the three waters, this is what your application should have been for other issues. That seems very odd, what is going on here. When something is popular, Waipai District Council will get behind it, and if not, it won't. For example, point two of your water fluoridation submission, the purpose of uh, local uh, government... Sorry, Kane, look, uh, that's, that, that's it. I'm sorry. We, we are, um, we're not going to relitigate something that is not anything to do with a subject. And I'm going to ask Kieran to um, remove you from yeah, the meeting. You've proved my no. point. You've proved my point, Andrew. You've proved my point. Okay. Thank you. You've proved my point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so moving on, is Ruth available now, Kieran? Uh, no, Ruth is not here, but we do have Tom Davies here. I don't know whether he is available, is, is okay to speak now, so I don't have a point of contact with him. Uh, Tom, if you're hearing me and you're um, happy to go forward with your submission. Um, oh, I see you're there. So great. Uh, I'll just let everyone know that your submission is on agenda page 102. And um, there will be a bell at eight minutes, Tom, and um, you have 10 minutes to carry on. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. Ena koutou kautaua. I'm here solely representing myself as an involved rate payer, and I applaud the review, and um, as it is of the council, and appreciate the courage that it perhaps takes to go through this review. Um, my personal preference is that uh, perhaps we should be reviewing the community board in a similar manner. The current structure of both community boards and council, um, I think was excellent for the 1980s, the 1990s um, from then. Um, but I just question um, with the changes in community, just how 
um, if we may not be overrepresented at both with community boards and council. Um, we are a relatively small population and uh, we need to ask ourselves what is the right size for elected representation. Um, we also need to ask ourselves what is the most appropriate structure going forward for, into the future? Um, is our current structure the right one? And can we do that? Can we right size within government controls? I believe we are extremely well serviced um, with the, our various media, and that is one of the most significant changes um, that we've had recently. So in addition to newspapers, which have been around for 100 years or so, um, we have things like a word from Waipa, what's on in Waipa, Waipa link, um, the Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Antono. Um, so we're extremely well serviced um, with um, all of those um, media. Um, and I think that the COVID pandemic um, has forced us, the whole community, to take a, a greater um, responsibility for ourselves. And so with this greater responsibility, perhaps as responsible ratepayers, we don't need the size of the elected representative representation that we had in the past. And that's all I have to say, answer questions. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Tom. Interestingly, uh, the, the um, submissions so far seem to be more on the point of community boards, which is being reviewed along with um, uh, council councillor representation um, than anything else. So, uh, yeah. So do I have any questions for Tom? I think we've taken your points, Tom, and thank you for um, for making the time to to um, come and see us and represent us. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Okay, um, I understand that Ruth is still not with us. So, yeah, we're, we're trying to get hold of her, Andrew. So we're just suggesting maybe a break. Sure. Um, and then Glenn Morgan is at 10.50. So if we get hold of her, um, we could come back 10 minutes early. Right. So if you uh, people, yeah, we'll take a break now. If you just keep your eye on things, if we get hold of Ruth, we'll resume at 10.45. Um, otherwise, it will be 10.50 for Mr. Morgan. Um and uh, just be warned that um, even though we're taking a break, I understand the live streaming will continue. Um, so you may want to mute your, um, or possibly stop video as well. Okay, rightio, so we'll see you uh, in half an hour. Cheers.
Hi, Ruth. Um, I, the meeting will be starting again at 10.45 when we all um, hear your submission. Oh, and I see you there too, uh, Glenn. So, yeah, um, you're on at 10.50. So, yeah, catch up with you then. Cheers. Andrew, could I ask you something, please? Sure. I'm trying to work this the the um, information out. I've got the you on the iPad, but I've got all the submissions and information on my laptop. Could you always tell me the page number yeah. and so that I can actually get to that? Yes, yeah, sorry. I can't, um, I can't look at the um, the list of you, you know. I can't get to that list either. Um, yeah, no, I, I've got them all here. I just uh, sometimes thanks. forget to give it to you. So sorry. Thanks, so much. thanks, Andrew. All good. Hey, Andrew, do you know what I did? I took a photo of that thing of all the meeting dates, all the meeting times on my phone. So I've got three things going. It's pretty simple. Help <laughs> good you on out. you. Good <laughs> on you, Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Make life simple. Aye. We've all got to try and do that. Especially with your view behind you. Man. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, no snow yet. You don't want to admit to being simple, Bruce. <laughs> no, oh no, no, don't do that. Excuse me, Chief Bruce and Andrew, did you want to return to the meeting? Uh, yep, let's do that. Is it is it quarter two? Near That's enough, anyway. 41, yeah. Okay, okay. I'll stop. I think there's a few people still um, to join us. So we'll just wait till um, 10.45 before we resume. So which page is the next one on, please, Andrew? And Ruth is on page 96. Thank you. Of our agenda. And um, Glenn is page 184. But I'll, I'll, re I'll reiterate that when um, the time comes. Kane Titchener definitely wasn't on 137. His his submission was just a very, wasn't a response to, uh, it should have been on 137. No, well, it wasn't. Yeah, I agree with Graham. Um, I don't know where it was. Yeah. No, I couldn't find it. It wasn't on 137 anyhow. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. It was time. That's weird. It, it was definitely, um, he did make a submission, but that was a, uh, yeah. only uh, like a, yeah. a hand, couple of lines, and he clearly was yeah, wanting right, to, right. you know, um, yeah. <laughs> get on his bike. Yeah. If you look at the red number in the top right corner yeah. of the page, that red 